and start with body relaxation. Bring your focus up to the top of your head and allow all of the muscles of your scalp to release and relax all the way down your face, all the way down the back of your head. As if someone had poured water on you that was exactly the right temperature. Forehead unfurrows, jaw unclenches. Relaxing down your neck and through your throat. Imagining that your circulation flows freely from head down to neck, down to shoulders. No blockages, no tension. and focusing on your shoulders, allowing them to drop down into their natural position. Scanning back and forth across them, imagining they come into perfect balance. One is not higher than the other. releasing any tension between the neck and the shoulders. and moving the relaxation down your left arm, all the way down through your elbow and wrists, down through your fingertips. Tension on your left arm, leaving through the fingertips, dissolving into space. and shifting your focus over to your right arm, relaxing down through, going down the shoulder, down through the elbow, the wrist, through the fingertips, tension dissolving into space.
and bring your attention to the base of your neck and walk your focus down vertebrae by vertebrae down your spine all the way down to your seat picturing that your whole back comes into straight alignment strong without tension all the way down from neck to seat. And as you bring your focus down to your seat, allow your concentration to settle there for a moment, feeling grounded and stable. And you can move your focus forward into your hips and your stomach and your chest. And imagine scanning through your internal organs, encouraging circulation, encouraging release of tension, allowing everything to soften and settle into its natural positions. making the whole front of your body soft and receptive. Your back strong and stable. and gently pulling or encouraging that relaxation to go down through your left leg, through all the muscles and joints, tendons and ligaments, all the way down the left leg, through the feet, tension leaving through the toes, dissolving into space.
and focus back to the seat and the hips and pull and encourage relaxation down the right leg through the muscles and joints, tendons and ligaments, all the way down through the right feet. Tension leaving through the right foot, dissolving into space. And think to yourself, all sentient beings are empty of inherent existence, but don't realize that. I shall bring them happiness and the causes of happiness. I shall separate them from suffering and the causes of suffering. I shall make them inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering. I shall set them in equanimity, free from attachment, aversion, and indifference. And so just really revive and awaken your motivation using the four immeasurable thoughts. You can put them into your own words, into your own language, but repeat and revive them until they feel resettled in your heart. True again. And then you can imagine that the four immeasurable thoughts take the form of the compassion Buddha, Chenrezig. His four arms representing each of those four immeasurable thoughts. And so feel that the presence of the fully actualized form of these is in front of you, facing you, present and supporting you. And if the image of the Buddha of compassion doesn't resonate, you can make it simple white light. So whether it's simple white light 
or forearm Chenrezig. Feel that these four immeasurable thoughts are not only within you, but present outside of yourself in their perfected form. And that you can take refuge in these as ideals, as values to frame your life by. Whether from a spiritual perspective or a secular perspective. That these four exist in every single sentient being whether latent or awake, small or large, but bring awareness to the presence of the four immeasurable thoughts, both internally and externally. and settle your mind single-pointedly on the form of the Compassion Buddha or the white light. And see if while holding this image, you can connect more viscerally, more deeply with the essence of compassionate wisdom beyond words, beyond analysis. this form, those conceptions married together. And then returning to gentle analysis, see if it makes sense to say within yourself, may I have love, compassion, joy, and equanimity come to me. May I send love, compassion, joy, and equanimity from me. May others bring these qualities out within me. May I bring these qualities out from them. And whenever there is a meeting of minds, a meeting of hearts, may it have this mutual benefit, encouraging these higher qualities from each other. collaborating and growing them together. And strengthening that, we add the mantra of Chenrezig, the Compassion Buddha. Om Nani Apen Me Om Om Mani 
Pen Mehum. Om Mani Pen Mehum. Om Mani Pen Mehum. Om Mani Pen Mehum. Om Mani Pen Mehum. Om Mani Pen And then continue, O Mani Pemehum, silently, under your breath, imagining that compassionate wisdom continues to resonate within you, continues to resonate out. O Mani Pemehum, O Mani Pemehum, O Mani Pemehum. O Mani Pemehum. And dedicate the merit of this practice to actualizing those four immeasurable thoughts in their perfected form in such a way that we're able to encourage all sentient beings to do the same. And you can relax your attention. Okay, so see you in a few minutes. Just kind of gather your attention so that you feel present. Closing your eyes gathering your focus, coming back to your motivation. Okay, so um, 
you know, this practice of taking a minute and going within and gathering your attention, even for 30 seconds, um, is important. Um, and, it, you know, and it's important to not just kind of, uh, I don't know, go off on a tangent or space out or look at your phone um, coming into presence. I think you guys do in a million ways in your life, probably in your professional life a lot, but as many times in the day as you can consciously come back to your heart, consciously come back to your motivation, will increase your mindfulness of the things that are important to you. And I know that that's obvious, but it bears repetition. So these simple little things, these little moments of silence, these little setting of intentions are like recalibrations. It's coming back to what you already believe so that it strengthens and deepens and becomes more vast. And it's through the power of repetition that you get better at it. It's through familiarity that these things become your behavior not as often things you have to stop and think about. They just are who you are. So it's that repetition and familiarity that builds depth. Um, and so, you know, it's your life, do what you want, but um, just kind of a reminder of why we do these things. It's that repetition builds strength, repetition builds depth. Um, and that's, you know, not just a Buddhist idea, you know that through neuroscience, you know that through psychology. So um, this semester is going to be um, a, a gentle one where it's not like tenants, where it's so intellectually difficult. This one is very intellectually easy, but experientially hard. And it's very easy to kind of talk over the surface of these ideas and not actually hit where your own experience is. So this semester is going to be really about your own experience and your own resistances to things that you already care about and believe in. And it can be a really intriguing process and a really important process. And the more that you do it, of course, the more you invite it from your friends, your family, your clients, patients, etc. cetera. But um, I, I think that it's, it's important to name the fact that something like the four immeasurable thoughts, which will be the main emphasis of this semester, is super easy and you've understood your whole life in some degree or the other. The point here now is why is it that we aren't always in alignment with the things that we hold as the most precious? You don't have to be Buddhist, you don't have to be religious at all to think compassion and love are vital. You've thought that for your whole adult life, you've thought that probably through your childhood, love and compassion are vital. And yet, why don't we always practice them? Why don't we always give them? Why don't we feel them from others when others have them for us? quite a lot of the time, but that doesn't mean we feel the impact of them directly always. Why and how is that? So these are really intriguing things kind of to talk about, as you guys would say, experience near, and um, maybe even just feel kind of relieved and relaxed that it's not an intellectually heavy semester. It's an easy, gentle in terms of your intelligence, but don't let that, um, miss the profundity of how deep these concepts are and how deep you can go with them if you want to. So, um, so this semester is your fourth year um, and it's called the path to happiness and satisfaction. And so you're gonna be doing a little bit of reviewing of refuge, which was the topic of your last retreat. We'll be doing the four measurable thoughts in quite a lot of depth. We'll be doing patience in quite a lot of depth. And then briefly, we'll do a summary of what are called the 37 harmonies with enlightenment. And you've looked at some of these, like for example, the first four are the four close placements of mindfulness. You've already kind of looked at those at least nominally, but we're gonna kind of go through these. And then um, as a part of that, a little bit more depth with the Noble Eightfold Path. So here's the main content of this semester. And 
the four measurable thoughts is what we'll be using for our motivation prayer and our motivation revival for each class. And so we'll use this version. But um, if on Wednesdays when I'm not there in person, you'd prefer to do it in Hebrew, then um, please do it in Hebrew if you'd prefer some days. These are your two books. Um, these books are what we're going to use the whole semester. I might do a handout from some other text occasionally and email you the PDF. But um, I'll try and remember to put both the electronic and the hard copy page numbers for your readings for each week. Um, today, we're looking at chapter one. And after class, please read after class your follow-up reading. It's only a couple of pages. So just make a mental note right now that the follow-up reading for today is pages 21 through 29 in the ebook, which is the same as page two to 11 in the hard copy. So just take a minute to write that down and remember to do that. Okay, so does, does everyone have the book or is, are a few of you still waiting for it to like come in the mail? Does anyone not have it yet? We need you to send it. There are some people that need it. Okay, okay, so I'll send, um, uh, this week's, but please do buy it and um, please do not pirate it or use a library copy. I mean, of course, if it exists in a library, but the point is don't steal it. It's really important. Please don't steal it. Okay, so um, for the first little bit, we'll be using this book. For Wednesdays, we're going to be looking at Refuge. And um, we're doing pre-recorded classes, and there's a PDF that I sent all of you that goes with the first few Wednesdays, but there's also a reading related to Buddhism, one teacher, many traditions. So I'll send you an email to remind you of the readings each week, but for the first few weeks while we're on Zoom, think Mondays in praise of great compassion, Wednesdays, Buddhism, one teacher, many traditions. Yeah, so it'll be kind of like two courses parallel to each other, but they're related. And the reason I'm doing it this way is many reasons, um, partially because I have a lot of classes about refuge already recorded, and I have the feeling that it's more interesting to listen to a class that I taught with other human beings rather than a class where I was just talking to myself in my room. Yes, so I'm hoping it's more fun to listen to. So Refuge is going to be on Wednesdays, some pre-recorded classes I have from other groups. Okay, does that make sense? And um, for those Wednesday classes, it, Refuge is going to be the main theme a little bit on Bodhicitta, but Bodhicitta is going to come up again and again, and you're going to go into more depth with Bodhicitta with Yael next semester. So right now, just kind of drill down into what are your thoughts about your spiritual refuge, whether you feel comfortable articulating it and sharing it or not. On those Wednesdays, again, it's intellectually very easy. I'm speaking from the Buddhist point of view, obviously, but try and hear it with ears that say, what is the benefit? What's the benefit of having an internal refuge? What is the benefit that I see in other people who have one? And what are ways in which I can come to my own that feel authentic? Doesn't have to be Buddhist, doesn't have to be Jewish, doesn't have to be anything, it can be your own, but a centralizing focus where you feel spiritually oriented, even if it's only one word, like peace or like compassion. So on Wednesdays, please really hear it with ears of your personal experience, not with too much space as if you were just like watching a TED talk at home while eating snacks. You know, try and hear it really from a personal point of view rather than a too much distance. And if you have questions, please do write them down as you're listening to those classes, because I'll make sure that we have time at the top of the Mondays to talk about any things that came up on the Wednesdays. 
All right, so for Immeasurable Thoughts, um, I'm gonna take some readings from the book um, starting at chapter one. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to read this on the board and you can let me know after class if the font was not big enough, but uh, hopefully you have some book or a friend with a book next to you if it's not big enough. Okay, so first we're just looking at this word. What does immeasurable mean or boundless? And those are the Sanskrit and Pali words there, which I will not attempt to pronounce. Um, they're called immeasurable or boundless for several reasons. So first, they are directed with a mind free of prejudice or partiality toward an immeasurable number of sentient beings, meaning all sentient beings, which are so vast, you could not count them because they're so vast. So first, we're just going to look at this concept of what is a mind free of prejudice or partiality? So you probably know, but in English, prejudice means a preconceived opinion that is not based on reason or actual experience. And the example would be English prejudice against foreigners or ingrained religious prejudices. And it conveys a sense of dislike or hostility. And that's just the English dictionary definition of prejudice. And when you see not based on actual experience, it means not accurate actual experience. Okay, so of course we all have a million prejudices born from our life experience. Some of which maybe aren't actually prejudices, they're just opinions or information or patterns that we've seen that our brain is telling us have caution. And maybe it's useful and maybe it's a survival mechanism and maybe that's fine. What we're talking about are the prejudices that are born from assumption and a mistaken observation of patterns you know, like something very obvious, like racism or sexism or homophobia or something like that. Obvious forms of prejudice where you formed an uneducated, ignorant opinion based on one or two pieces of information, one or two experiences with individuals, and then made a huge generalization and decided everyone who looks or seems or acts this way is of this type that I don't like, right? So when I'm talking about prejudice, I'm talking about that very obvious form that we see in daily life in a million different ways, but also the very subtle form that might not have a big title like racism. It's those little inner aversions that says, those people should be a little bit distant from me. Those people, are a little less than me and mine. Those people are not worthy of my respect or my attention or my affection. Those prejudices particularly, I think are worth examining because our coarser prejudices are more in societal conversation and are hopefully more obvious to us already. Of course, they bear examination every now and then to make sure you haven't gotten stuck in your ways and old fashioned and forgetting kind of the spectrum of the human condition and gotten yourself kind of old, you know, for lack of a better word, because it can happen to us all. But those ones, I think we're self-aware enough to know our little hangups that are obvious. Here, we're looking at those tiny everyday versions where maybe even just the sound of someone's voice is enough to trigger it. And once it's been triggered, your heart shuts down. And once your heart shuts down, the first thing is that you're more uncomfortable and they feel less safe, which makes them either feel needy and depressive or have their own defensiveness and aggressiveness and your whole heart shut down has been the catalyst now for their reactivity. Not necessarily, like everyone has the responsibility for their own reactions, but often our having been triggered into prejudice shuts down the heart and that has an effect on the person in front of us. Whether it's spoken or unspoken, there's an effect and you know that. So these tiny internal prejudices are things to really 
deeply examine, particularly when we're trying to work on developing immeasurable thoughts because they need to be free from this. So that's prejudice. And then we have partiality, which is just the other side, right? It's like an unfair bias in favor of one thing or person compared with another favoritism. So like a particular liking or fondness for something. And again, this is just the English definition. What we're talking about is not just a preference in terms of function or a preference in terms of affinity. We're talking about a preference that has an edge to it that says, I need, yes? That this is the source of my happiness. It's exaggerated. The partiality says, it's not just kind of a general preference I have about people behaving this way or that way. It's that my preference is truth. And that's the problem, right? That you're moving beyond acknowledging that it's a preference or an opinion that you came to through a million experiences in your life, you've actually solidified it into thinking, this is how people should be. And when they are, I like them. And I will reward them with my attention and affection and respect. That type of partiality is problematic in many ways. And it's not like it's the opposite of prejudice where prejudice closes the heart and partiality opens it. It's not like that. It's that partiality reaches and clings and grasps and it objectifies whatever it likes. Even if it's a person, it makes the person into an object and that person is an object to give you happiness and you like them because you say in your mind that they give you happiness. But then as soon as they don't behave the way you want, it triggers aversion. So the switch can flip from partiality to prejudice, just like that. They're both based in exaggeration. And, and again, this is all very obvious to you guys. You're self-aware. This is your work every day, all day. You understand about people's prejudices and partialities. But when you're looking deeply internally, I think it's helpful to examine the energetic quality of these. When there's a feeling of push or pull, of I want more of this or less of that. And what that kind of back and forth does in terms of the level of agitation of your mind that day and the level of stress from that. And because of that, how effective you are or aren't. You wanna make it personal about how actually the push and pull in the mind makes you less effective, less beneficial, less clear, and your creativity is less expansive because you're too stressed to come to new ideas and new solutions or new ways of communicating. The push and pull in the mind takes up a lot of mental space. And that mental space is not comfortable space. Yeah, it's either sort of avoidant or craving and hungry. And so to have an immeasurable thought, we want to kind of preemptively manage our prejudices and our partialities. And all of this has to be done with a mind of humor, with a mind of authenticity. So to say, I understand prejudice and partiality are to be avoided, therefore I don't have them, would be an exaggeration, would be what we say in English, gaslighting yourself. You're basically telling yourself lies because you want to go to this higher truth and you're skipping all the steps of what you actually feel. So none of this is about pretending to feel anything different than you feel. It's about managing the reasons and the catalysts and the ingredients for your experience so that different feelings arise in response to old triggers. All right, so point being, there are there correct reasons and logic for prejudice and aversion or partiality attachment? Because we have them, don't we? We have them, it's obvious that we have them, but what is it that reinforces them or allows them to stay? In our mind, do we think there are correct reasons? So, 
Of course, there are obviously many natural, and I put natural in quotes, and spontaneous emotions that arise with certain types of people, certain types in quotes, right? But those do not make those emotions necessary or helpful. How or why do we justify prejudice and partiality? These are the questions we want to ask ourselves. So the, you know, the big thing here is that to be an immeasurable thought, it has to be free from these, but how is it that we're trapped in them to begin with? Yeah, and I think that when you're examining these in your daily life, it, it becomes very confronting because you have a story about why you allow old ways of thinking to stay. And they usually feel like they support you or they protect you. And that's why you keep them. But if you keep them in an unexamined way, it becomes very problematic because then you never evolve past kind of an animal way of functioning in the world. And from a Buddhist perspective, an animal realm being you know, with their fight and their flight and their instinctive attitudes, it's an ignorant realm, even though there are smart animals. And as human beings, we could choose to live like animals, but it would be a great sadness to miss the opportunity for development that we have with a human brain and we have with our mind entering into a human brain. So I put the word natural emotions in quotes because natural just means habitual and maybe makes sense from the perspective of animal instinct. But the question is, must we live by animal instincts or can we have self-directed evolution? It, because it's natural, does that mean it's necessary? Are all things that are natural good. You know, you go to the grocery store and you look at the ingredients on a bag and it says all natural ingredients. And you think, oh, it must be healthy. But you know, sugar is from nature. It's from sugar canes. If you had only sugar canes, would it be healthy? No, you know that you're an adult. Natural doesn't mean necessary. Natural doesn't mean healthy. It just means habitual. So this is where we're starting to look at, in my own life, my prejudices that say I need more of these kind of people and less of those kind of people. And that kind of push and pull, we start with what is reasonable. And it might be very reasonable that due to your conditioning, due to your socialization, a certain type of rudeness is hard for you to communicate with. But then you remember what you know from tenants and the philosophy of emptiness and dependent arising. And you remember that the concept of rudeness is a dependent arising. And what is rude in one culture is not rude in another. It's all based in perspective and context. And so your reactivity is coming from you, not triggered by their behavior. You know that in a philosophical way, while at the same time acknowledging you have a habit and your habit says, these three or four behaviors are too much for me because I was brought up to believe that they were unacceptable. But just because I was brought up to believe they were unacceptable doesn't mean they're unacceptable from their own side. So you see this dance that you start to do in your mind of, I know the broader big picture dependent arising story and I know my own immediate reactions, and I'm gonna look at the two together and ask, okay, what is the behavior I find so triggering? Some sort of act of disrespect, for example. No one likes to feel disrespected. First of all, we have no idea what people's motivations are. So you have to remove that from the whole story of they wanted to disrespect me. Who knows? <laughs> maybe they did, maybe they didn't. The other piece is what are the behaviors of disrespect? Are they pervasively true in all contexts at all times? And you just kind of go through and you think, oh, okay, for some people, respect looks like time and attention. 
For some people, respect looks like being efficient and having less time and less attention and cutting to the chase. For some people, being slow and methodical and kind of having a lot of eye contact and explaining things slowly is an act of respect because you want them to understand. For other people, they'll find that condescending and patronizing and want them to go quicker and use bigger language and be speedy. You know, so it's like, you know this intellectually, but you can't talk over what your own experience is. <laughs> and your own experience is something that has been with you for a long time, especially as we get older, it gets more and more crystallized and concrete feeling and a sense of it being obvious and unchangeable. And that's the, where we want to start challenging it, acknowledging what's happening while poking it a little bit and seeing if there's some flexibility that we can introduce or reintroduce. Okay, so that's one reason why they're immeasurable is they're free from partiality and prejudice. Then in addition, they are ideally to be practiced in states of dhyana, in which the limited intentions of desire realm minds have been superseded. Although meditators, may have been born in the desire realm, their minds become form sphere consciousnesses when entering a dhyana with one of these four as its objects. So your meditation object, you know, and we say object not in a visual sense, but your meditation object could be love, compassion, joy, or equanimity. With these as your object of single pointed concentration, which of course first needs analysis to get depth with and stability with. But once you have these as single pointed objects of meditation, you can develop into form sphere consciousnesses. And that's something we'll talk about more later. But just to kind of review, because you might be forgetting what these terms mean, the desire realm is where we are, okay? Where our minds are. I'm assuming, all of us, at least speaking for myself, I have a desire realm mind. So it's one of the three realms of cyclic existence. It's the realm where sentient beings are overwhelmed by attraction to and desire for sense objects. So we're constantly wanting to stimulate our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, etc. And it's upon attaining serenity, shine, calm abiding, a human being's meditating mind becomes a form sphere consciousness, although their body might remain a desire realm body. So this form realm is a realm in samsara in which beings have attained subtle bodies. They are born there by having attained various states of concentration, higher concentrations. And then from that form realm, which is kind of a confusing term, but we're talking about very subtle form, you move to the formless realm. And this is a realm in samsara still, in which sentient beings do not have a material body and abide in deep states of concentration. Okay, so just reviewing, you remember this picture of the monk and the elephant and the rabbit and the monkey going up the path in the nine stages of developing calm abiding? We got to the top of the path, the monk achieving calm abiding here flying in the sky. Once you've achieved shine, perfect calm abiding serenity, you go on to the form and formless realm absorptions which are higher meditative states. And this is what we're talking about with using the four immeasurables as meditation objects for these higher states of consciousness. So these dhyanic states and dhyana or jhana just means a meditative absorption or concentration in the form realm. Dhyanic states are also imbued with the five dhyanic factors, which are investigation, analysis, joy, bliss, and one-pointedness, and this renders them boundless or immeasurable. Okay, so four measurables aren't just nice ways of living. They're not just core values for daily life. They're also higher forms of concentration once they're fully developed and integrated. 
So we start with just a conversation about them, right? Like we're doing now, getting clearer and clearer analytically with our analytical mind. And when you develop a very strong clarity about what exactly each of these four are, intellectually and experientially, then you can meditate on them, right? And right now you probably could meditate on any of the four immeasurables single pointedly after a brief analysis to remind yourself of kind of the visceral experience of them, right? You could think about like, for example, compassion. You could think about a time when someone was very compassionate towards you and the effect it had on your mind and then a time where you felt great compassion for someone else and your heart was completely open and there for them. And just using a few memories and a few intellectual catalysts, you could have kind of a heart experience of compassion being present in your mind. And then you would release the analysis and just stay with compassion. And that could be your object of single pointed attention. Rather than the breath, rather than the mind, rather than a mental image, a concept, right? And with great stability, having already achieved calm abiding, this takes you to the form realm absorption. And a form realm absorption is an incredibly high state of concentration where meditation is always blissful and you're actually always in a kind of a meditative state. No, okay. So have I lost anybody or are, is it clear how we can also talk about the four immeasurables in terms of meditative concentrations? Why clear? No okay. Same. Okay, so more, why immeasurable? So the four immeasurables are also called the Brahma Viharas. And you'll hear this term more in the Pali tradition, in the Theravadan tradition sometimes called the Hinayana, but we don't use the word Hinayana if we can avoid it because it has a pejorative looking down kind of connotation. So the Brahma Viharas are the framing that you'll hear in the Pali tradition, which means divine abodes or abodes of Brahma. Abode just being a place or a house or a place of being. So that means after Brahma, the deity who is the ruler of one of the Dhyanic realms, where beings' minds are pure, smooth, and gentle. So the dionic realms, the form realm, for example, you still are in samsara, but your afflictions are very much subdued and not manifest. Your suffering is very much subdued and not manifest, but you haven't purified the karma for those. You still have the predisposition for those. However, while you're in that realm, your mind is very pure, smooth, and gentle. So in the term Brahma Vihara, Brahma implies pure because these four are free from attachment, anger, and apathy. Okay, so Brahma is, you know, can be sometimes a problematic term or a controversial term because of course Brahma is also spoken about in the Hindu tradition. So from the Buddhist tradition, we believe Brahma exists but we do not believe he is the creator of the world, not a creator God. There is no creator God in Buddhism, you probably remember. The creator of the universe is all of our minds, right? We don't believe in a paternalistic, monotheistic God God, capital G God. But in Hinduism, they frame a lot of those qualities as qualities of Brahma. In Buddhism, we talk about Brahma, but we just talk about him as a being who has a very high level of consciousness and rules over the form realm. So very kind, very compassionate, very powerful, but not the creator. Does that make sense? So same guy, same being, but in Hinduism and Buddhism, we speak about him differently. And in the Buddhist tradition, we're just using Brahma Viharas, Brahma in the sense of pure, as in free from attachment, aversion, and apathy. So that's why they're called the Brahma Viharas or the four divine abodes of Brahma in English. Yeah, so anyway, don't get stuck on the word Brahma if you know it from other places. We use, uh, we have a different idea of who Brahma is in the Buddhist tradition. 
So they are also the best. Another implication of the term Brahma, you know, like the Brahma caste in India, the very problematic caste system, Brahma is the highest or the best. So that's another implication of this word because they are beneficial attitudes to have towards sentient beings. They're the best attitudes to have towards sentient beings. These four are also called abodes or ways of living because they are peaceful resting places for the mind and that they are virtuous mental states that help us live in constructive ways that help ourselves and others. So when we're talking experientially, if you're remembering experientially the difference between love and attachment, for example, you might want the other being to have happiness in both cases, right? You want the person that you're attached to to be happy, and you want the person that you love to be happy. Sometimes it's the same person, and your mind is switching back and forth between attachment and love. But when you have attachment, the mind is agitated. When you have love, the mind is calm. When you have attachment, you're kind of panicky and wanting to fix and wanting to solve and wanting to manage and wanting to control and make happiness happen for the person you're attached to. When you have love, you wish them happiness. You look for ways you can support their happiness. You look for ways that you can bring happiness out of them, send happiness towards them, however you want to frame it but it's not controlling or panicky or forced. The mind is not agitated. And these are one of the easiest ways of telling if your mind or your motivation has gone afflicted or gone unafflicted. Is there agitation present? Is there stress present? Yeah. So when you're in these kind of four divine abodes, you know, you know that their nature is gonna be very smooth, very content very calm, very peaceful. And that's not to say bland, right? That's not to say beige, <laughs> you know, it's not to say that somehow you're missing the joy and the passion and the vividness of life or something, not at all. What you're taking away is the stress, yeah. So sometimes you hear about these and you think, that sounds very boring, yeah, it sounds a bit too neutral, and that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about taking the stress and the afflicted characteristics out of our emotions so that our relationships are more healthy and our mind is more peaceful. Okay, so compassion is often confused with empathy, right? The colloquial definition of empathy, the psychoanalytic definition of empathy might be closer to compassion or might even be the same as compassion. We could talk about that but the colloquial understanding of empathy is not the same as compassion. Neither is sympathy, neither is pity, neither is empathic distress. So love is often confused with attachment, right? The colloquial understanding of attachment, not the, psych not the normal psychology idea about attachment theory. We're talking about colloquially, Love is often confused with attachment. It's also often confused with appreciation, affection, or affinity. And now, and I'm not saying any of these other words are good or bad per se. Yeah, some of them, you know, like pity is obviously negative, but a lot of these are good things, generally speaking, but they're not what we're talking about when we talk about compassion and love. So then joy is often confused with like excitement or aspiration, or hope, both afflicted and unafflicted hope. Then equanimity is often confused with neutrality, with indifference, with lack of opinion, or making false sameness. And I think for you guys, I think that the first three you're quite clear on, but sometimes when I hear you talk, there is some confusion about what the word equanimity means. And sometimes it sounds like you think it means to be neutral. And that's not what it means in this context. Okay, so what is not compassion? Your suffering makes me suffer for you and with you 
to show you I care. Okay, that is not compassion. This is all very obvious, right? But just to make sure we're all on the same page, this is not compassion. Love is not, I can't be happy without you. And I'm happy when you're happy, right? This is like codependence, right? Not joy is I'm intoxicated by your presence or your success is my success. That is not joy in this context. And then not equanimity, a good example we see all the time is I see no color, I see no race, right? That's it, nonsense, it's not equanimity. Or to say we are equal because we are the same. That is superficial, that is not deep enough, that is not true in all ways. This is not the equanimity we're talking about, okay? So these are not sugary, sweet, Hallmark cards, Americanisms. These are not positive thinking. These are very deep concepts that we're talking about. But it's easy to kind of fall into the trap of oversimplifying them. Okay, so just to revive, compassion is the wish for sentient beings to be free from suffering. Love is the wish for sentient beings to have happiness. Joy is the wish for sentient beings never to be separated from the happiness free from suffering. Equanimity is the wish for sentient beings to be, a fr to be free from afflicted partiality, attachment, aversion, and indifference. Okay, this is what they are in this context. And there are longer, broader definitions, and we'll go into them when we go into each one individually. But just, you know, making sure that you remember that you do already know what these are and get it nice and tidy in your mind. So compassion understands the potential for freedom while bearing witness to suffering. And that's why in Buddhism we say there is no such thing as compassion fatigue. There is empathic distress. Empathic distress is when you're only bearing witness to suffering, but you're forgetting the potential for freedom, right? So when you look at compassion, you're holding two things at the same time. And when you understand that this person in front of you is suffering, but their nature is not suffering, that they're not permanently suffering, that their mind always has the potential for freedom, then it doesn't wear you out as much to watch their suffering or to speak about their suffering or to just even observe tragic things on the news. Love understands the causes for happiness and supports those causes for happiness, okay? It understands that the causes for happiness, not excitement, not you know sugary sweet sort of spikes of excitement, but real happiness, real contentment, comes from positive beneficial states of mind. Yeah, altruistic states of mind. And so because we understand where happiness comes from, we support the positive and beneficial in people rather than just kind of symptoms or conditions to make them temporarily happy. We're thinking about the deep causes. So then joy, it depends on which tradition we're speaking from but it could be that it's empathic joy that resonates with the happiness of others. So you're not identifying with their happiness, but you're resonating with it. Or you could be rejoicing for it or rejoicing for the causes. Equanimity understands sentient beings, universal drive in wanting happiness, not wanting suffering, despite the fact that their methods and degrees of success vary. So it's understanding that we're all the same in this way. We want happiness, we don't want suffering, and our choices come from trying to achieve that. We also have equanimity on the basis of understanding we all have innate ignorance about reality, about ourselves. We understand that also we all have Buddha nature and the ability to develop fully into our potential. 
do you feel like you're ever stuck with any of those four or you have the general sense of them quite clear by now, or do you get kind of an intriguing thought or a doubt or something come up with any of those? Yeah, they're pre- I mean, they're pretty obvious, but since we've been talking about them for a few years in some way or another, do you ever feel like one of them is somehow missing something or reminds you of something interesting parallel in psychoanalysis? I thought about equanimity that it has to do, uh, um, I would say maybe it's wrong in English, not prioritizing anything. Not prioritizing what? Anything. Anything. I mean, maybe, I mean, prioritizing, maybe, maybe better to say like, um, I don't know, giving too much importance, but you can still prioritize in terms of timing. Like this is more pressing and needs attention sooner. This can wait longer, or this person's needs are more immediate. This person's needs are less immediate. You can prioritize in that way and still have equanimity. But I think that you're right that in in the sense of your heart, there's a difference in like having a priority about some people are more important than others. You're trying to remove that kind of priority for sure. it's, It's difficult because it's not like with equanimity you stop having different levels of rapport, right? You can still have different levels of rapport with people. Some people you get along with easily, you understand easily. Some people you don't understand, you don't connect with immediately, but you're not letting how much rapport or affinity dictate your level of affection. You're not letting that be the criteria for how much goodwill they get. So you acknowledge that you do have more or less kind of relational closeness with some people than others, but the relational closeness is not the reason for how much affection they get. It might change what affection looks like, but not the heart sense of it. You know, like I might hug my mother, but I'm not going to hug the person at the coffee shop right? But I want to have the same level of care for both of them. You know, obvious like that. Yeah. So then with your patients, I just wonder, you know, I'm sure that in your mind, there are some patients that you look forward to their visits and some patients where you have a little bit of resistance, a little bit of, this is a more challenge and you want to have an open heart, but you know, if you're honest with yourself, you might have a little bit of aversion when you know they're coming through your door, you know, and you know that as an analyst, you want to be having equanimity with all of your patients, but that's not to say you don't acknowledge that some of them, there is flow. Some of them, the flow seems more difficult, but of course, by now, you know that whether there is flow or not, doesn't necessarily mean it was a good session or a bad session per se, especially over the course of time. Some of the hardest sessions are sometimes the best sessions in terms of whatever you want to call progress, right? But in terms of just that feeling in your heart of my heart is open and my, I guess my mind is ready for you and receptive to you, keeping that in an equanimous way I'm very curious about what you do with back-to-back patients, maintaining that or coming back to that, or if that's even a conversation you have in your mind. What do you do to stay balanced with everyone without lying to yourself? Is it just an intuitive thing that you gently adjust when you remember to? Or are there a series of thoughts that nudge you back into alignment? How do you have equanimity with your patients? Ethics. Ethics? Sometimes, I mean, sometimes you need need ethics to to 
help to, to achieve it. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, would you, yeah, sorry. I guess also in times, with times, then you get to love the ones that you didn't love at the beginning <laughs> because you understand the causes. Right? And then you don't need the ethics anymore. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I, I suppose that the ones that you don't love as much right away, because of your experience over many years, you know that you will love them, even if you don't yet. <laughs> and maybe it gives you more patience and space to maintain an ethical stance, something like that. I can't say I got to the reach when I cannot say it, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> That are very like regressive or something very did something very harmful and going on doing things harmful. It's yeah. It, it reminds me of uh, something that that venerable children says all the time, um, which is a quote from Alan Wallace, which is the afflictions are not lovable. You do not have to love the afflictions. You should not love the afflictions, but the afflictions are not the person, right? And I think this is very helpful when you're stuck with someone. It feels like you have to love all of their behaviors and their motivations when their behaviors and their motivations might be quite unhealthy, quite damaging, quite, as you say, regressive. You don't need to love those. Those are not them. You know, and that's part of why in, in Buddhism, we can be so seemingly aggressive about saying that thought is wrong, that emotion is wrong, when to put it so directly and so maybe simply can be triggering for people who are involved with psychology because you want to be more accepting and more kind of um, holistic and embracing the whole experience of a person. In Buddhism, we say some thoughts and behaviors are wrong and removable, and they're not you, so it's not going to hurt you to work on them. You know, and when you're looking at other people, some of their behaviors are unacceptable because they harm themselves and they harm others. But in no way does that mean I don't love them. I love them more because I see all the things that prevent their happiness. I want them to have the actual causes for happiness, you know? And so you kind of going to that deeper place that doesn't need to do mental gymnastics to try and make bad behavior okay with you. You go deeper underneath and say those behaviors aren't them anyway. But, you know, easier said than done, right? Okay, so we'll dedicate. And we'll dedicate with this version of the four immeasurable prayers, um, four immeasurable thoughts that I think you all know. So just taking a minute and settling the mind, gathering all the thoughts of the session. May it go to these aims. All sentient beings who although self and all appearances are dharma dhatu by nature have not realized it thus. I shall endow with happiness and the causes of happiness. I shall separate from suffering and the causes of suffering. I shall make inseparable from happiness without suffering. And I shall set in equanimity the cause of well being, free from attachment, aversion, and partiality. And so, your follow up reading for today is to read in the hard copy, pages two through 11, the ebook pages 21 to 29. And I'll email you a reminder after class. And then for Wednesday, from February 23rd until March 23rd, that whole kind of month, you know, month period of time, you're looking at just chapter two. So however fast or slow you want to read, try to finish chapter two before March 23rd, okay? So in Buddhism, one teacher, many traditions, read the refuge chapter. Okay. That's Thanks, everybody. Time. See you later. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Nice to see you. <laughs> Talk more.